I'm very excited about this course, Frontiers in the Diagnosis and Treatment of Neurological Diseases. I mean, it's been over 10 years ago when I was in medical school trying to decide what specialty to go into. I loved the instant gratification of surgery, and the amazing part of delivering a newborn baby, um, really loved psychiatry too. Um, uh, it's so interesting seeing how the mind works in that way. Uh, but ultimately I did choose neurology and at the time, none of my classmates, my good friends in medical school really understood why I chose neurology. Um, why wouldn't choose something that was more lucrative or uh, had a specialty with a better lifestyle? And, you know, to be honest, at that time, the clin our clinical rotation in neurology was sort of limited. You know, we didn't have as many treatments to offer to patients, and it was very frustrating seeing patients with these debilitating conditions. But what my classmates didn't understand was that the field of neuroscience was exploding. Uh, I had just finished my PhD in neuroscience looking at synaptic mechanisms of how synapses you know, were actually their own little modules. And there are all these developments like uh, channel rhodopsin was just being developed uh, where you could specifically control the activity of neurons and turn them on and off. Uh, we were using techniques in the lab to get specific uh, molecules into the lab, targeting different proteins to turn those proteins on and off. Um, and then there was much more, the technology was becoming better so that intracranial recordings in awake and behaving animals was more sophisticated with higher resolution. And on the clinical side, you know, I knew there was research looking at uh, different ways to measure plaques and different substances, uh, neurotransmitters in the brain. So, and then we're also learning a lot about mechanisms of MS, um, pretty much a new, um, almost a new type of diseases, um, neurologic diseases, the perineoplastic syndromes was um, burgeoning. And uh, I just knew that the next few decades were gonna be a boon for neurology based on the discoveries that we're making in the lab and I wasn't wrong. So I haven't looked back from deciding to go into neurology. Today, we'll start off with the spinal cord and then after that, we'll hear a presentation about multiple sclerosis from Dr. Joanne Guo. Okay, and so my talk will be brief. The anatomy primer will start off with some basic definitions, go over components of the nervous system, and then really focus on the spinal cord, its relationship to the brain, to the body, and the bones, and then we'll briefly just talk about some of the spinal cord disorders. So um, I thought it would be good to just go over some of the terms that you'll probably hear people using. And um, rostral really means anything that's close to the head, towards the head. Caudal is towards the tail or to the back um, where we would have a tail. <laughs> Um, and then ventral and anterior are referring to the front of the body, dorsal and posterior are referring to the back of the body. Okay, and then also you all, I'm sure know this already, but the basic component of the nervous system are neurons, which include a cell body where there's a nucleus that contains the genetic material and um, where most proteins are made. And the neuron really receives information from the dendrites and information goes from the dendrites to the nucleus and then to the axons, uh, which convey 
information to other axons or other neuronal cell bodies or dendrites. And these are some of the major types of neurons. And in addition to neurons being the central unit of the nervous system where electric information is kind of transferred electrically and then chemically, there are a number of supporting cells. And this is an oversimplification, but the main supporting cells are the astrocytes. And um, these cells uh, provide that they're the most numerous supporting cells in the brain. And they, they're star-shaped, which is why they're called astrocytes. They help with kind of exchange of nu nutrients from the blood. And then they also help form this blood-brain barrier. So they can help control passage of substances from the blood into the cerebral spinal fluid. Then also, you know, these, when these cells kind of over multiply or go awry, they, they are the underlying cause of like uh, one of the most devastating cancers of glioblastoma, multiforme, and such. Then we have ependymal cells, which line the ventricles, the spaces within the brain where CSF circulates, and then also down into the spinal cord. They secrete, they make and secrete cerebral spinal fluid, and they have these little hair cilia that help move the fluid along. Oligodendrocytes are found in the central nervous system. They provide, uh, they generate myelin that is a covering around the axons, and this allows for conduction. Uh, it serves as an insulator, prevents uh, mis firing of signals and also allows for faster conduction um, uh, transmission along the axon. In the peripheral nervous system, these cells are called Schwann cells. And then we also have these microglia, which are really derived from the immune system, and they uh, remove cell debris and waste um, and kind of help mediate any inflammatory response that's needed when there's uh, pathogens that are in the brain. The other term you'll hear people using a lot is white matter and gray matter. And just as a reminder, gray matter is really the cell bot is areas of the brain and nervous system where cell bodies of the neurons are concentrated. And they're arranged in distinct layers in the cortex here. And the white matter are really the axons that are coming from those cell bodies traveling to deeper gray matter structures in the brain. So where neurons are synapsing onto cell bodies in these deeper matters. And um, you can see here, gray matter is arranged on the outside of the brain, but within the spinal cord, it's actually inverse. So gray matter is sort of protected in the central part of the spinal cord. And then the outer part is where the fiber tracks of the axons go. All right, now focusing on the spinal cord, uh, you, See here, there's uh, it's really forms in different sections, and it forms along with the bony spine. Uh, the bony spine grows a little bit faster, and you can see that it ends up being much longer than the cord itself, which ends right about at L2 or the lumbar region. Um, but the the bones continue on down all the way to the sacrum. And so you have the cervical portion, which controls sensation in the back of the head, as well as in the arms, the thoracic nerves, which control sensation and muscles in the, in the trunk, in the chest, in the abdomen, and then the lumbar spine, which controls movement in the legs, the sacral nerve roots also go to the, um, sacral area, the perineal area, and help to control urine function, um, bowel and bladder function. 
this is the spinal canal within the bony, within the spinal canal. And this is the kind of like across, this is like a cut of the spinal cord. And I've switched it backwards because this always confuses me how they orient things, but um, this is posterior and this is anterior. And so this is also posterior here, and this is anterior here. And you can just sort of see the organization, again, the gray matter here. In the anterior section, you have more of the, the ventral roots, which are motor roots, and then posteriorly are the sensory roots that are coming from the dorsal root ganglion, where the sensory nerves are coming in here. The spinal cord is, you know, more than just a conduit from the brain to the body. There's a lot of different <clears throat> uh, cells and process, different um, processing units in the spinal cord itself. But ultimately, um, the, you know, we think of signal, motor signals and sensory signals originating from the brain and sensory signals coming into the brain. So for example, this is a classic motor pathway. Um, once you decide to move a muscle, you know, that neuron in the primary motor cortex of the frontal lobe is activated. That goes down through that neuron here, sends its axon down through the top of the spinal cord where it crosses over onto the other side. That's why the brain the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body and vice versa. And then goes into the corticospinal tract where then, so this is called the upper motor neuron and the upper motor neuron synapses onto the cell body of the lower motor neuron in the gray matter of the spinal cord. And then this, neuron goes directly to the skeletal muscle to cause it to contract. In the opposite direction, we have the sensory pathways. So for example, here, vibration, proprioception, uh, where you knowing where your limb is in space and light touch comes in from the skin and the extremities. It goes through the dorsal, so the posterior and the back root ganglion where there's a usually a pseudo bipolar neuron that then sends its axon here, goes up again in the white matter tracks of the posterior columns in the back. Then it crosses over in the bottom of the brainstem where it goes to, ultimately it goes up to the brain, which is the primary somatosensory cortex and that's right behind the motor cortex in the parietal lobe. Uh, we have, so sensation is pretty complicated. Um, in addition to vibration, we also have pain and temperature uh, sensation, which goes through different nerves and actually goes through a completely different pathway. Um, it, these pain and temperature fibers also go through the dorsal root ganglion, but then they cross pretty quickly over to the other side into the white matter tract called the anterolateral pathway or the spin spinothalamic tract. And then once it crosses, it just follows up into the thalamus, one of the deeper parts of the brain, and then finally to the somatosensory cortex. So at each level where these uh, sensory fibers are coming in, they go to a specific dorsal root ganglion of the spinal cord. And we can actually nicely plot out uh, which uh, part of the body, the region of the skin that's receiving the sensory input. And so that's why if you do come to a neurologist, we're testing sensation at these different levels because we're trying to figure out if the sensation is coming from a specific nerve root um, or if it's more general coming from the brain or even from nerves, which is different. 
Um, and you can just see each level, for example, sorry, the colors don't align, but let's see very commonly. So L5 uh, is right here. You can see it enters the spinal cord there and then um, you know, follows those sensory pathways that we discussed. And I thought this is just a nice illustration of the spinal cord doing a lot more than just being a conduit of information. For example, when we're testing reflexes, we can test specific levels of the spine. So here we're testing the triceps tendon. And um, when we stretch that tendon, there are these sensory receptors that detect the stretch and they go directly to the spinal cord again through that dorsal root ganglion into uh, where the cell bodies are. And it actually synapses on two different neurons. So one neuron, motor neuron goes to the triceps muscle to cause it to contract. And then the other synapses onto an interneuron. So this neuron then synapses onto the biceps tendon, which is opposite to the triceps to allow it to relax. And so the biceps relaxes, but the triceps contract, so you get the reflex. And you know, one of the most important things when thinking about the spine is its relationship to the spine itself. And these are nice images looking at how the spine is related to the um, bony structure around it. So it's very well protected, um, but you can see that a lot of problems can come out when these discs, which are um, what cushion the spinal cord, you know, as we age, they tend to bulge or um, shift and then that can cause compression not only backwards into the spine but it can also cause compression here and bulge out so bulging discs can hit the nerve roots this depending on where it's hitting can cause pain it can cause weakness it can cause numbness as well all right and uh, when, you know, some of the most common diseases of the spine we see are really compressive based on degeneration and arthritis of the spine. And this happens when there's bulging discs or when there's fractures or when there's um, disc osteophytes, so little bony outgrowths of the spine that can um, really damage the spinal cord or the nerve roots as they come out. And then, of course, trauma can also damage the spine. Uh, other things that can affect the spine are conditions like transverse myelitis, which can be caused by multiple sclerosis that we'll hear about, as well as other autoimmune diseases and inflammatory diseases. Uh, tumors do affect the spine, both metastatic and primary tumors. And infections that cause abscesses or um, some, some viruses can directly, um, directly go to the spine and affect the neurons in the spine. And there are neurodegenerative diseases that affect the spine, such as ALS, and which affects both the upper motor neurons and the lower motor neurons. And then there are disorders of um, vitamin deficiencies or toxic conditions which can disrupt signaling preferentially in the spine. A little bit more rarely, you know, just like we get strokes or ischemia in the brain, there can be strokes or spinal cord infarctions of the arteries going to the spine, as well as vascular malformations that can really affect spine function. And that's really it for my anatomy primer. These are the main uh, references that I took the pictures from. So um, with that, I'll just introduce Dr. Joanne Guo. Um, having worked with her on several cases now, I know that she's just an incredible, amazing, empathetic clinician. Uh, she's a fantastic speaker. She presents at our annual recent advances in 
neurology course, which is geared towards physicians really all over the country. She is an integral part of the scholarship and excellence of our UCSF Multiple Sclerosis and Neuroinflammation Center, which is housed here at the Weill. She, uh, just a little background about her, she graduated summa cum laude from Ohio State University, where she also did medical school, and then um, went, to, went on to do a residency at the prestigious Columbia University Medical Center in New York. Luckily, she moved out to the West Coast to do her fellowship in neuroimmunology here um, and joined our faculty afterwards. So I'm really excited for her to start off our course. Uh, I couldn't think of a better person. Um, and she'll talk about multiple sclerosis, which has been one of the really transformational areas of neurology where our scientific understanding and drug development has really come together to make just a huge impact on changing the course of patients' lives. Thanks, Joanne. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Maggie, for that wonderful introduction. I would say all the same things about you as well. All right, so as Maggie mentioned, I am a clinician in our UCSF Multiple Sclerosis and Neuroinflammation Center. I do primarily see kind of new diagnosis and kind of chronic management of people living with multiple sclerosis, but we also have a broader neuroimmunology, neuroinflammatory clinic where we see other associated diseases and also other types of autoimmune inflammatory diseases that affect the central nervous system. But today I'm gonna to be talking primarily about multiple sclerosis. So many of you here may have heard of this disease or at least have some idea of what it is. Very broadly, it's an autoimmune disorder of the central nervous system, meaning it primarily affects the brain and spinal cord. It's a type of condition that we categorize broadly as a demyelinating condition. So as Dr. Wong mentioned, myelin is that fatty tissue that is around nerves and protects nerves and helps basically nerve conduction run faster. And so most classically multiple sclerosis is characterized by areas of inflammation and demyelination. So injury to this myelin. And oftentimes we can sort of see this injury on magnetic resonance imaging, also called MRI. So we can sort of visualize this imaging um, with testing that we have, you know, in the hospital, in the clinic. Um, but it's also a condition that over time can also injure, you know, the axons of um, the axons and the nerve cells themselves. Um, and sometimes we can't always see this as well on imaging over time, someone who's had very long-standing multiple sclerosis, we may see this as, you know, atrophy or shrinkage of the brain. And then oftentimes um, it's something that's better visualized actually sort of post-mortem or after someone passes away and actually um, looking at the pathology tissue. You know, before we had the ability to do MRIs and to um, image people the way we do now, you know, when this condition was originally described, they really could only look at it after people had passed away and they could actually see these areas of inflammation and plaque and scar actually on people's brains and spinal cord. And that's how it got the name multiple sclerosis, literally meaning just multiple areas of scar. And so this is the most, one of the most commonly, you know, conditions that affects morbidity and mortality in, in young people. It usually presents in young adults age 20 to 30 years old, has a prevalence rate that ranges from five to 300 per 100,000, um, and tends to have higher rates at higher latitudes. Uh, the development of MS has been associated with um, a few different things. We're still not sure the exact etiology that sort of, I, we don't think there's sort of one thing that causes MS, but it's probably a lot of different factors that come together and there's different associations that we've seen with it. Um, so one of the strongest associations we've seen with it is actually uh, less sun exposure, low vitamin D levels, which is why we think we see it more kind of in higher latitudes. And uh, certain genetic factors, certain genetic alleles have been associated with uh, the development of multiple sclerosis and carriers of the, these types of alleles are probably are at higher risk for developing MS, childhood obesity, cigarette tobacco use, and something that has been getting a lot of buzz lately, but 
that we've recognized in the MS community for a long time is the likely association with you know, Epstein-Barr virus and the development of MS and other types of potential viral triggers as well that may lead to the development of MS. So again, it's probably not one factor, it's probably multiple things sort of coming together that leads to the development of, of MS and we're still trying to understand that fully here at UCSF. So the clinical presentations of multiple sclerosis, there's sort of different phenotypes or different clinical presentations you guys will probably hear about. Um, the most common type is called relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, which is characterized by recurrent neurologic symptoms that can last weeks to months, but usually improve or at least partially improve over that time frame. So the types of you know clinic, we call them sort of like clinical attacks or relapses that people may have maybe things like vision loss, usually caused by inflammation of the optic nerves. We call it optic neuritis, itis meaning inflammation. Um, can also, if it, depending on where it affects in the brain or the spinal cord, you'll probably have focal neurologic symptoms related to that. So sort of, as Dr. Wong mentioned, you know, different parts of the brain and spinal cord sort of can map out um, to certain functions or like dermatomes, uh, weakness, et cetera. So sort of depending on what part of the brain or spinal cord is affected, you'll have certain types of neurologic conditions. So some examples of this could be, you know, weakness in the arm or weakness in the leg, um, could be bladder dysfunction with weakness in the leg, sort of any combination of it. Uh, the types of relapses are a little bit unpredictable and can also occur sometimes months to years apart, which can sometimes make the diagnosis really hard to make. Different from a stroke where symptoms usually come on sort of like, you know, we usually say like kind of snap of a finger, all of a sudden there's all these neurologic deficits that come at once. With multiple sclerosis, it tends to be a little bit slower. We call this instead of acute, we call this more subacute onset where things may develop over hours or even days and then sort of peak within like a couple of weeks and then get better over, you know, sometimes over a couple weeks to months at a time, sometimes with treatment, which I'll talk about in a second with certain treatments of relapses, sometimes people can get better right away. But the natural history of a relapse is that it tends to evolve a little bit more slowly, sort of hours to days, um, and then resolves over a period of time. And so this relapsing remitting um, designation refers to, you know, these intermittent relapses, with then some potentially remission in the middle. I think the part that's deceiving about this name is that you know not everyone sort of remits or comes completely back to normal, though some people do. Um, the more relapses that an individual has, probably the more uh, injury that's accumulated, the more neurologic symptoms that build up over time. When we take MRIs of individuals when they're having these like relapses or attacks, we usually see evidence of like an active inflammatory MS plaque, usually somewhere in either the optic nerve, brain, or spinal cord. Sometimes can be multifocal, sometimes can just be focal. Okay, so that's kind of relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis, kind of the majority of individuals that are diagnosed with MS usually are diagnosed with what RR MS first. Okay, and then uh, another subtype of multiple sclerosis is called primary progressive multiple sclerosis. And if you look at the actual pathology on the brain across like all these different types of MS, they will generally all, all look fairly similar. The difference in these designations is purely how someone presents clinically. So instead of kind of these classic, like you have a relapse and get better, have a relapse, get better. With primary progressive MS, people usually have slowly worsening symptoms from the onset. There can be active, you know, relapses that happen on top of the progression, and we also call that kind of active progressive multiple sclerosis, but the main difference is that kind of even in between events, it seems like someone sort of clinically is still slowly worsening, so meaning like instead of suddenly developing leg weakness that gets better over a couple of weeks, it's kind of a slow onset, like you develop a little bit of foot drop and then more trouble walking and you're tripping and it slowly gets worse over time. Sometimes this can still sort of stabilize out and sort of plateau um, at some point in the future. But again, it's very unpredictable what this course may look like sometime. 
the other thing that characterizes it is that even if someone is sort of getting clinically worse, we may not always see a clear correlate on imaging. And this probably has to do with the fact that there's other type of neurodegeneration that's happening that we can't visualize as well with the technology we have. Um, but likely there is, you know, radiographic progression that we can see along the way as well. And then sort of the dreaded um, long-term course that can happen sometimes where individuals start out as relapsing remitting MS over time can still potentially develop what we call secondary progressive MS. And so they kind of have a clinical course that is like relapsing remitting MS for many years. And then over time may then start to develop slow progression, even in the absence of relapses, even in the absence of like new lesions, that new active lesions that we can see on the MRI. And there's a portion of, it, of individuals who start out as relapsing remitting MS who may transition into secondary progressive MS. And so kind of the, the targets of and sort of the goal of all of the therapies we have at this time is trying to slow down this um, process of progression or trying to prevent new lesion formation, trying to prevent relapses. Um, but otherwise, this is the sort of natural history of, of these subtypes of, of multiple sclerosis. Okay, so the way that we make a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, uh, we've there have been new criteria. Basically, they revise this sort of every few years. And our most recent diagnostic criteria are from 2017. We call them the McDonald criteria. The What we basically aim to meet um, is this criteria called dissemination in time and space. So when you're trying to make a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, you're trying to show evidence that there is an inflammatory disease process that's one happening across different parts of the central nervous system, meaning like we see lesions both in kind of characteristic parts of the brain um, plus potentially characteristic parts of the spinal cord. And then you also want to see um, lesions that are sort of developing over time. So whenever I'm like thinking about a patient and trying to make a diagnosis for the first time, I'm always thinking, okay, does this meet criteria for dissemination in time and space? And so most classically, you know, if I see like a 32 year old that comes into the clinic and they have had, you know, an optic neuritis. And then when I look back in their history or look at their MRIs, I also see what looks like likely an old, you know, spinal cord lesion and they have clinical symptoms suggestive of an, of an old spinal cord lesion that may have recovered, you know, right there, you have what sounds like two events that affect two different parts of the central nervous system. And if sort of you rule out all other causes, you know, right there at that individual, would meet criteria for multiple sclerosis. There's, we've sort of revised the criteria now to sort of allow people to be diagnosed earlier. They don't always have to have two clinical events. Sometimes if they've only had one clinical event, and this is something that's sort of characteristic of MS, if we take a look at their MRIs and we see that there's old lesions, even if they don't have clear evidence that they were sort of symptomatic, from those lesions, we actually see this not infrequently where there's sort of this silent progression where lesions can sort of develop and because the injury is usually partial or there's in repair that sort of the brain and spinal cord does on its own, someone may not have noticeable symptoms from it or the symptoms were so mild that maybe they just ignored it in the past. If Even if they've had one clinical event, but we see that there's evidence of old lesions elsewhere, even if they didn't cause symptoms, that is sometimes enough to allow us to make a diagnosis as well. And the goal of that is that we wanna to try to make a diagnosis of MS as early as we can, because it does seem like intervening kind of earlier in the process before we've given time for more injury to kind of accrue and develop in the nervous system, likely the better chance we have of giving someone, you know, longer years of disability freedom or living like more normal, um, more normal life and function. Okay, so the MRI or magnetic resonance imaging is kind of our mainstay of diagnosing multiple sclerosis at this point. And so these are some characteristic findings that you might see on an MRI. So I'll just kind of use some of these technical terms that we've learned. So when we look at an MRI, when we're looking at these cross sections, we call this an axial view. 
And when we're looking sideways, we call this a sagittal view. And so on this sequence of M MRI, it's actually interesting because the gray matter actually looks white and the white matter looks gray. And so generally when we're looking at this, um, when you're looking at a brain MRI, usually the brain looks very symmetric. And so when there's asymmetries in the brain, they kind of pop out right away. And you guys can probably see that, you know, here there's an area of white, we call it a hyper intensity that is not on the other side. Um, interestingly, when we look at MRIs, they're also kind of flipped. So this side is actually the right side and this is the left. And so this, um, this type of MS lesion, we call it juxtacortical lesion, very characteristic for MS where basically um, you have a white matter lesion that just sort of right abuts the cortex, so juxtacortical. And then we also have here periventricular lesions, meaning a, a lesion that's sort of right up next to the ventricle of the brain, which is a normal kind of like open space in the brain. And so, so another area, very classic, we also call it Dawson's fingers because it almost looks like fingers kind of coming out of, from the ventricles of the brain. And this is an example here of a classic spinal cord lesion. So they tend to be ovoid. They tend to be oriented towards the periphery of the spinal cord. So it doesn't tend, usually doesn't involve the entire spinal cord. It's usually just partial. And so that's why sometimes people just have like symptoms on one side of the body and not always both. Uh, and then we call, they tend to be what we call a short segment. So over here um, are the vertebral bodies of the spine. And usually MS lesions only span the length of, of one vertebral body. Um, not always, but generally speaking. Here's some other examples of, of classic MS lesions. So again, another example of juxtacortical. Here's another view of those periventricular lesions that we saw. Again, you kind of get that sense that it's like kind of like fingers projecting from the ventricles. We also see them in the lower part of the brain, which we call the, the brain stem. And then other examples here of, of a spinal cord lesion, uh, the other thing that we do when we get MRIs, if any of you guys have had an MRI before, you might recall that they put an IV in and they actually put contrast um, into your veins. And so areas where there is active inflammation, you have breakdown of the normal kind of protective blood brain barrier. And so the contrast can sort of seep through from the, the blood into the brain or from the blood vessels into the brain. And so we will have contrast that kind of lights up and that sh demonstrates to us that this is a a lesion, an active area of inflammation, likely, you know, within the last couple of weeks to even a couple of months. And that's suggesting something that's new, whereas something that's not enhancing um, is probably old. And so hence you get that sort of separation in time there. Okay, so other diagnostic tools that we use um, is a lumbar puncture or also known as like a spinal tap, where we basically take a small sample of fluid out of the lower part of the spine we go at a level where you don't have, your spinal cord is actually ended and it's just the nerve roots. So there's no risk of like puncturing your spinal cord from doing a spinal tap. Uh, the goal of getting the spinal fluid is to look for evidence of inflammation. And you can also rule out infection and other possible causes of, of kind of this abnormal inflammation or neurologic symptoms. We also look for something called intrathecal gamut globulin synthesis, which basically just means we're looking for like abnormal antibody production within the spinal fluid. And so generally, if we see sort of abnormal antibody, antibody production that's specific and unique just to the spinal fluid, meaning it's something happening in the central nervous system that's not happening in the rest of your immune system, that's something it's not necessarily specific to MS, but is seen in probably 85 to 90% 90, 90 of people with MS. Uh, it can also just be a general sign of inflammation, so we can see it in other neuroimmunologic conditions as well, but sort of most classically, um, we call these oligoclonal bands. Uh, you may see that term come up. If you guys have you know, any history of working with anyone with MS or um, any background in, in neurology, you might have heard that term before. Okay, and something else that we use are what we call visual and somatosensory evoke potentials. So we literally will put kind of like leads, electric leads on people's heads, and we will actually measure kind of electrical activity from a stimuli. So how long does it take 
information to get from the eyes or from the hands and all the way to a certain part of the brain. And we actually just, you can actually just take time points and it gives you basically like a, basically a, a speed um, of conduction at the end. And basically if we see a slowing of, of how long it takes for information to get from you know one part of the body to the brain, that's usually a sign that there's probably some type of demyelinating injury somewhere. So if you imagine, you know, um, measuring like electrical conduction across a wire, if you were to take the insulation off a wire, you know, the electrical conduction would probably be slowed because it's not as efficient. It's the same idea, you know, when there's demyelinating injury to the brain or spinal cord or to the optic nerve. So we get that sometimes we also do this to help us confirm whether or not there's evidence of demy demyelination. It's a nice sort of like neurophysiologic correlate um, to what we see on imaging. And so can also be a tool uh, for helping us make a diagnosis of MS. Okay, so just a little bit about the natural history of MS. As I said, you know, the majority of people usually have an initial clinical attack or relapse followed by recovery, AKA having relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. The worry, of course, is even if you look well initially and recover initially from MS, you know, there's an estimate that 58% of individuals that start out with relapsing MS do go on to develop secondary progressive MS. And so this is in the absence of treatment. So um, this is all data that's sort of gathered from before we had, you know, uh, as potent of therapies as we have now. And then it was estimated 66% of individuals would go on to develop secondary progressive MS 16 to 25 years down the line. So that, that's always the worry. Again, why we always want to try to get individuals started on therapy is to hopefully delay, delay this further or, or prevent secondary progressive MS from developing. And as I said, you know, there can be a long period of time between relapses. Sometime this one natural history study estimated um, maybe even up to almost two years between episodes. Uh, the main thing that they saw is that if someone developed vision loss or optic neuritis initially, they tended to have a longer period until their second, second episode. Uh, slower progression seems to be related to having optic neuritis first. If, if you have a good recovery after your initial clinical event, that's probably better for you prognostically. Um, kind of the opposite of that would be if someone has a really bad initial relapse and doesn't recover, we worry that they might have a more aggressive, you know, course or may have in, you know, their relapses may be more severe that they may not recover as well from them. The longer time you have before your second relapse is probably a good prognostic indicator as well. And then having fewer relapses in the first five years so you could imagine if someone was having a relapse every couple months, that would be different from someone who's having a relapse, you know, every few years. And generally speaking, someone who's having relapses more frequently with multiple sclerosis generally tend to be at higher risk for disability down the line. Okay, so one thing I'll differentiate is how we treat a relapse from how we manage kind of multiple sclerosis as a whole. So when someone has a relapse, so they're having like a new inflammatory event, they suddenly develop symptoms over kind of the course of hours to days, they go to the emergency room. What generally happens is we treat them um, with high dose glucocorticoids. So basically steroids and methylprednisolone is kind of the intravenous medication that's used most often if someone kind of goes to the emergency room. And how we how we sort of practice and how we decide on treatment is all based on kind of clinical trials. We try to use uh, kind of data-driven, scientific method-driven uh, recommendations as much as we can. So they actually did do a clinical trial on this. It was called the Optic Neuritis Treatment Trial, where they took individuals where they gave them kind of a lower dose like steroid by mouth versus a higher dose steroid into an IV. And they found that, you know, the people who were given the IV steroids tended to get better faster. The one thing that they emphasized, though, is that kind of regardless of whether or not you gave them steroids, people usually kind of recovered on their own to the same level regardless, but the steroids definitely helps them get better or recover from the relapse sooner. 
you can imagine if you can't see or you can't walk or you know your bladder function is off you you probably don't want to wait and see if it gets better over the course of months you probably want to get better right away uh, just because that really affects overall quality of life um, so kind of a point about that and then one thing that we found recently is that if you dose steroids by mouth at sort of the same same dose um, likely it seems like it's about as effective as it is if you give it by IV. So generally speaking nowadays, especially if I'm treating someone in my clinic and I want to keep them out of the hospital and I think they're having a, a relapse, I might just treat them with, with high dose steroids by mouth. So then the kind of the other part of that is once we're done treating someone sort of in the hospital setting for like a new relapse with a new diagnosis, then we usually, after we've made a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, want to put them onto a long-term maintenance therapy. Right now, we don't have, you know, a cure yet for multiple sclerosis. So generally, we place patients on some type of maintenance therapy. And the idea of that is to sort of suppress the immune system to some degree to try to decrease this abnormal inflammation that leads to, that drives, you know, new MS relapses and that drives um, progression and worsening of MS. They all have kind of different mechanisms of action, which I'll, I'll go through very broadly uh, here in the next slide. So this is the timeline of multiple sclerosis therapies that have been FDA approved. As Dr. Wong mentioned, you know, we're really lucky in our field because we, over the last 30 years, basically every few years, there's been a new MS therapy that's been developed. And they all vary differently in, in their mechanism of actions and how well they work. There's some of them that have sort of similar mechanisms of action, but maybe better tolerated from a side effect profile. So I would say, honestly, almost all of these therapies that I listed on here, even the ones that are all the way back from the early and mid nineties, I, I sometimes still use them. They're sort of different enough that there could potentially be a place for almost any of these therapies. Um, there have been some therapies that have since been removed from kind of our, um, from our algorithm of use, just because they ended up having severe side effects, et cetera, or felt to be too dangerous. But generally speaking, any of the therapies that are on this list here, I have, I still use in my practice and in, um, in one form of, or the other. And the, if we sort of tier them, that's usually how I think about the, these disease modifying therapies or immunotherapies, and they have sort of increasing efficacy as we go down these categories. So the older medications are all actually, generally speaking, they're all injectable medications. Um, glitirimer, acetate, and interferons are just some of the names for these. And so they're all medications that people would give themselves uh, anywhere from like every uh, once a week to a couple times per week to like every day. And then after that, they came out with different oral medications. And again, these oral medications also have kind of differing efficacies as well. And then kind of the highest efficacy medications we have generally are what we call monoclonal antibodies and infusion-based medications. So these are all medications that sort of, these monoclonal antibodies target specific parts of the immune system in different ways. Um, some of them, again, are more immunosuppressive than others, but that's one way when I'm talking to my patients about what different therapies there are out there, I sometimes tier them in this way just to give them a framework of, of what therapies we may consider. And then, as I mentioned, there's also many different mechanisms. I'll just give a couple examples because I don't want to get too bogged down into this. Um, but some examples would be, you know, some of the medications that we call the S1P receptor modulators, they act on the receptors um, that prevent white blood cells from basically moving out of lymph nodes. And so if we actually measure like someone's white blood cell count, what we call their lymphocyte count in their blood, it would actually look low. And it's not because they're gone or we've destroyed them with the medication. It's actually just because those white blood cells are sequestered inside the lymph nodes and can't come out. And so we think that by preventing those white blood cells from getting out of the lymph nodes, it at least prevents you know the abnormal, the bad acting white blood cells from getting into the brain and spinal cord. Um, 
And then another example would be a medication that we use very frequently here called ocrelizumab. And you'll notice all the monoclonal antibodies end with the, with the letters MAB, MAB. So it targets something that we call CD20, which is found on the surface of a certain type of white blood cell called B cells. And so by targeting that, it leads to cell death of the B cells and so depletes immature and naive B cells. So suppresses the immune system to some degree and sort of, again, disrupts this potential inflammatory pathway. Um, other examples include, you know, uh, medications that sort of uh, prevent white blood cells from proliferating. Some of them, again, lead to white blood cell uh, depletion or death. Uh, and some of them also, natalizumab is an example where it doesn't suppress the immune system, but basically just targets something called alpha-4 integrin, um, which is found on white blood cells and which allows it to sort of move across the blood-brain barrier from the peripheral immune system into the central into the central nervous system. And so it doesn't actually deplete your immune system, but just prevents white blood cells from kind of getting across the blood brain barrier. So again, I won't get too much into that. Uh, usually when I'm telling patients about these types of therapies, I'll, I'll probably choose like a few options for them based on um, what their sort of lifestyle goals are, um, how active their disease is, et cetera. And we'll sort of go through a few of them, but just to give the sense that there's a really wide range of, of mechanisms of actions for these therapies. Okay, so as I mentioned, it's a shared decision-making process between the, the physician and the patient for how we decide which therapy to go on. And I often will spend usually like six, a 60 minute visit kind of sitting down with a patient after we've made the diagnosis, et cetera, and kind of talk about this. So it, it's certainly not an easy one. Um, I think when people imagine, you know, certain types of conditions, uh, sometimes there's better algorithms for it where we say, you know, if you have this condition, then we treat with X. It's a little bit more complex in multiple sclerosis because there's a lot of unknowns and we actually don't have a lot of scientific data right now to help us guide whether or not we need to put everyone on a really strong therapy early or not. Um, for certain individuals, you know, things that you might take into account is their age, you know, certainly someone who's older, you might be more worried about putting on a lot of immunosuppression because they'll be at increased risk for infections compared to someone that's young. Similarly, if they have a lot of other medical conditions, uh, they might be, again, more at risk for infectious complications. Um, the type of multiple sclerosis they have plays into it. Uh, for instance, you know, primary progressive MS really only has one approved therapy on there, whereas pretty much all of the therapies are approved for relapsing MS, but only one is formally approved for progressive MS, so that makes a difference. Um, the level of disease activity and other characteristics of the disease, you know, if you get um, someone at initial presentation and you look at their MRI and they actually have, you know, a, a high burden of MS lesions and you suspect that they've probably had MS for a long time, you know, you would probably be more inclined to put them on something that's high efficacy rather than one of those lower efficacy therapies. And then pregnancy, you know, pregnancy planning comes a lot into trying to decide uh, what treatments to put people on because almost all of these medications, uh, it's difficult to be formally on when you're pregnant. And so we sort of have to decide how do we dose a medication around your pregnancy? Because some medications are dosed just every six months, some medications are dosed um, every day. So we have to plan around that as well. There are certain medications, you know, that if we were to suddenly stop it when someone's pregnant can actually lead to worsening of MS disease activity. So these are kind of like the complex decision-making that goes into deciding what treatment to put people on and is oftentimes uh, can be challenging to kind of talk people through. And so even um, my colleagues who may be specialized in sort of non-MS or non-neuroimmunologic conditions, I usually tell them, you know, if you don't feel comfortable advising on starting a therapy on your own, like you can, you're always welcome to refer to us for us to kind of go through the pros and cons of each of them because it can be challenging. So as I mentioned, we're trying to understand better, you know, what types of treatment should we put people on early in the course of disease. And at least right now, you know, we tend to be moving towards starting people on higher efficacy therapies earlier. So potentially starting like 
a high efficacy oral medication or one of these monoclonal antibodies early on, on in the treatment course. And there has at least been these retrospective observational studies that suggest that um, there's lower rates of sort of disability progression when we do that. Very classically, even just like five, 10 years ago, it was um, very typical that if someone was diagnosed with MS for the first time, you would sort of right away start them on one of those lower tier, like first tier um, MS options, like, you know, the injectable medications, and then only escalate them further and further up if they had more disease activity or breakthrough disease or relapses. But the concern is that in doing that, you sort of allow someone to develop kind of more um, injury to the central nervous system over time. So now we tend to be a little bit more aggressive. Again, it's hard to make it a blanket statement because things differ so much individual by individual, but we overall tend to be leaning towards, you know, starting higher, higher efficacy therapy earlier. And then just to say that there's certainly always new uh, research that's going on and another mechanism of medication that's being looked at is something called the Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So Bruton tyrosine kinase or BTK is a critical molecule in intracellular signaling from B cells and other types of white blood cells. And when they've looked at this kind of mechanism of medication in mouse models, so there actually is a mouse model of, of multiple sclerosis. It's called EAE, where so they sort of have the, the mouse version of MS that's sort of um, induced in them in the lab. When they use these medications in the mouse models, it looks like it does lead to um, reduction in inflammation overall. And so the nice thing about these medications, as I mentioned, you know, there's all sorts of different forms, injectable forms, medication you take by mouth, medications that are given intravenously. The nice thing is that the, this is a, would be a high efficacy, potentially a moderate to high efficacy therapy that would be dosed by, um, dosed by the mouth. Um, so it's cheaper and probably easier um, to get to patients. The other thing that's a little bit different from the other treatment options we have currently is that it seems to do a better job compared to the medications we have currently of getting across the blood brain barrier. And so one of our concerns is that, you know, none of our MS medications are perfect. And I would say they're all um, have very modest efficacy against treating people that have progressive MS. And so if you, by the time you're treating a patient, if they already have progressive MS, it's sort of harder to kind of pull the brakes at that point. So the hope is that this type of medication may do a better job of targeting and treating progressive MS. And so at this time, you know, we basically treat individuals with multiple sclerosis kind of indefinitely. There are definitely certain treatment options that are thought of as sort of more definitive treatment where the idea is you give someone a treatment for only a short period of time and they may not need treatment later down the line. But again, even these treatment options haven't been shown to definitively halt multiple sclerosis. So at this point, generally people are on some sort of treatment for, you know, usually years and years. And the decision to come off therapy is often, you know, based on maybe a patient just has never tolerated treatment. They've always had, you know, some type of side effect or maybe a very severe infection. Um, it could be, you know, someone has had a very mild disease course and they've had, they've been very stable for 30 years. That might be a time to think about pulling medication off. But again, we don't really have a lot of good research because we've only had MS treatments out for the last 30 years to really tell us, okay, when's the right time to stop. So we, there are actually ongoing clinical trials that are looking at this. And so hopefully we'll have better data um, to guide our patients. Cause you know, at, at this point I have patients who are in their 60s, 70s, even 80s. And it's oftentimes a very difficult decision to try to decide, you know, do we start therapy at this point? Do we potentially stop, et cetera? And so the other thing we do sort of day to day um, in the clinic is also just monitoring, monitoring individuals and taking care of them long term. And so there are different parameters we use to help us decide, you know, whether or not someone is sort of clinically stable or as stable as, as we can tell. One would be number of relapses. You know, the goal would, of course, be to have as minimal relapses as we can, or maybe even get to the point where they're having no relapses at all. Uh, we use the MRI in our general surveillance as well, and take a look at things like, 
Are they developing new lesions? Do they have new active lesions? Something that we're trying to understand better is looking at overall brain atrophy and how we can use that to kind of predict how someone is doing. And then also the other thing is, you know, just having patients come to the clinic and examining them, you know, looking to see how their strength is, how does it compare to last time? Um, we have specific types of tests that we do that, that are also objective measures. One is like the time 25 foot walk. So we actually just have someone walk 25 feet um, every time they come to the clinic. And then we have a number that we can follow objectively, like, okay, I'm starting to see that your walk is slowing down by one second, two seconds, et cetera. And that could be an early sign that someone is actually developing more progressive symptoms. Um, the nine hole peg test can look at hand dexterity. We look at visual acuity. We do something called the symbol, dig symbol digit modality test, which is a test of cognition. So again, none of these markers are perfect. And we're definitely looking for more ways that we can get even like more granular in how we, we track individuals um, uh, disease progression, but these are some of the examples of things that we do in the clinic currently. And so when we are looking at someone's overall disability, we actually use um, an extended disability scale, and it kind of goes from zero to 10. 10 is essentially death, zero is like no symptoms at all. And so this is another way just to kind of communicate to another neurologist, just like when they look at the note, they can tell sort of right away someone's overall level of disability. And so kind of up to a level of, of four, um, usually it means the symptoms are fairly mild and may not be interfering as much with someone's day-to-day -day function. By the time you get to a four, uh, usually that indicates someone has a limitation in how far they can walk. Uh, when you get to a, a EDSS score of six, that usually that's someone's walking with a cane at that point. By 6.5, they're walking with a walker. And sort of, you can imagine kind of going above that, you're getting to individuals who are then sort of wheelchair or even bed bound, so more severely disabled. And just to make a few points about, you know, once we make the diagnosis, what do people living with MS sort of experience on a day to day? It can be a myriad of, of neurologic symptoms and some of them more disabling than others but just want to highlight some of them that may be a little bit more, you know, invisible. I think, you know, when you, we see someone walking with a walker, we see someone in a wheelchair, that's a very visible sign to us that someone is disabled, but there's other symptoms, there's other ways of, of being disabled that may not be as visible. One is depression and anxiety, you know, depression, and anxiety affects 20 to 50% of people living with multiple sclerosis. There's higher suicide rates in individuals with multiple sclerosis. Um, suicidal ideations associated with age greater than 65, having bowel or bladder dysfunction, swallowing dysfunction, speech involvement, you know, it's sort of unclear, you know, whether or how much of the depression anxiety is associated with something kind of structural change that's happened in the brain versus a lot of the psychological factors that go on with having a chronic illness. You know, it's likely that it's a combination of both. Uh, but it's something that, you know, we always try to screen for when patients come to the clinic, it can really affect their overall quality of life. Um, many patients sort of perceive their overall disability level and function as worse if, they're dis if their depression or anxiety levels are high as well. Fatigue is another huge thing. This is definitely something that's seen in just chronic illnesses in general, and especially chronic inflammatory illnesses. So it's reported in at least 75% of people living with multiple sclerosis leads to loss of work hours, leads to unemployment. I have patients who are even on disability for fatigue because it's just hard for them to tolerate getting through the day. Again, it's likely multifactorial from CNS damage, from medication side effects, from immunologic abnormalities, sleep changes, disability status. And it's really, really hard to treat. Um, I find this uh, extremely challenging for patients because they'll be very frustrated. You know, they'll feel like their walking is fine. And physically, if you examine them, they, they look overall well. Um, but the problem is they just have severe fatigue and that can be, you know, extremely disabling, can contribute to depression, et cetera. So the strategies for that um, is usually multifold. You know, one is telling them strategies for energy conservation. So I always give the example of you know, you're someone who can't charge your battery as full, like your phone battery just doesn't charge as much. You're someone who just, you can't fill your gas tank up as much. So you just have to frequently recharge, but you may, 
be active, be productive for a few hours, but then need to rest. And a lot of that's, you know, listening to um, one's body and kind of when, if they have the ability to rest when they can, and I usually tell them to do that. Cognitive behavioral therapy is something else that people do to help them figure out strategies for energy conservation, you know, maximizing their sleep as much as we can. Um, I tell people to make lists. So say like you might have at one point been able to do like 10 things on your to-do list for the day. Let's shorten that down to five. Uh, we also do use stimulants if all of these lifestyle modifications don't work. So all of them are off-label, but like things that you might imagine that you use for like ADHD, et cetera, we actually use some of those medications to treat MS-related fatigue. This is just an example of our kind of treatment algorithm for looking at bladder dysfunction, because that's another huge thing um, that we can see with, with multiple sclerosis and spinal cord injury in general is having difficulty with controlling the bladder. So potentially going too frequently or having urinary accidents or on the other side, not being able to urinate or like empty your bladder fully. And so I won't go through this necessarily because it's more medical, but just to show that we have different ways of managing this from like a physical therapy standpoint and also um, medications you take by mouth and also procedural standpoint. And, and then, of course, the big thing is making sure that we're treating um, walking difficulties and falls. So, you know, walking is dependent on a lot of things. It's both both how much strength you have and endurance, but also balance, cognition, attention, all of that. Um, so people living with multiple sclerosis uh, tend to have these types of issues with difficulty walking due to weakness and different things. The other thing that we tend to see very classically with MS is that people have a lot of foot drop. So they just can't lift their foot at the ankle. And so as a result, they also tend to hyperextend their knees. Um, so it can give a very characteristic type of walk. And so it can be challenging. You can imagine you would get very tired if one of your legs was weak or you were dragging your foot. It's also very easy to trip over your foot as well if you're not able to pick it up as much. And that's a really huge reason for individuals to have falls. And so we recommend identifying early if someone has any issues with their walking or if they're fall risk, getting them into physical therapy early, using some type of assistive device. You know, I always tell patients, unfortunately, we can't always completely stop the progression of multiple sclerosis, but if we aren't able to, then we need to maximize safety. We need to reduce risk for falls. So if someone is falling a lot, you know, I'm gonna tell them you need to be using a cane, you need to be using a walker, maybe even using a wheelchair more regularly. You know, a lot of my patients often develop a lot of fatigue. So as they walk further, they, they just notice a lot of their neurologic symptoms sort of come out further as they get fatigued. And so that may be a reason to use something like a wheelchair or a motorized scooter. Okay, so this is my last slide here. So just some other examples as well of sort of MS related symptom spasticity. So like increased muscle tone, which is something we see from spinal cord injury, again, in general, um, can be painful. It can also affect, you know, the ability to use a limb if it's very spastic and tense and hard to move. Pain is very common. You know, anytime you've had injuries to the central nervous system, there's sort of a dysregulation of how sensory input comes into the brain and that can be felt as very severe neuropathic pain. A cognitive impairment, that's something we see in probably about 50% of individuals living with MS. It's usually not a classic like dementia type of memory loss, though I, there are some patients who have very severe and advanced multiple sclerosis that can look very similar to kind of a more typical like Alzheimer's dementia patient. But most of the time, it's more um, sort of attention related processing, thinking processing related sort of inefficiency and in thinking uh, word finding difficulties. And then also sexual dysfunction, very common as well, and, and can really affect individuals' lives. So with that, I will wrap up here and I will end um, my slide share. You know, I'm always struck by how the explosion of treatments for MS, because again, back when I was in medical school, really, we only had that first tier of medications that was low efficacy. So we're seeing a lot of disabled patients. And it seems like most of the new therapies, even if they're not directly impacting the immune system, they're really affecting how the immune system is working. Mm -hmm. How has your treatment of MS patients changed during COVID? 
where you know we're worried about people who have lowered immune system? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a really good question. I would say our initial strategy was to even think about you know taking people off therapy or delaying their their treat you know read treatments um, depending on how how long they've had MS, how severe their disease is. You know, generally people who were older, who were more stable, who had been on their medication for many years, those were individuals we were even like delaying kind of treatment or even stopping, you know, that sort of pulled our, pushed our hand sometime to say, hey, you know, you're seven years old, you are in a high efficacy therapy, you've actually been really stable for a long time. This might actually be a very reasonable period to pull back. So there was certainly that decision that came in. Um, there were individuals that I just tended to start on some of these like not truly immunosuppressive therapies that were more immunomodulating. So like I had talked about, there are certain options that don't really truly suppress the immune system and can still have pretty moderate to high efficacy. So if they were eligible for that, I did that. Um, but then there was just the reality of there were individuals with really, you know, uh, aggressive or active MS, and we just didn't feel comfortable holding their therapy. So it was just a kind of a risk benefit ratio. And we just told them to kind of do as much as they could to minimize their risk from COVID-19 and, and to probably still start, start therapy. You know, the good thing was that overall, even though some of our medications are definitely associated with an increased risk for symptomatic and severe infection, there didn't seem to be a definite association with increased risk for death from being on a disease modifying therapy. So kind of just weighing the risks and balances there. And then of course, now that we're in kind of a post vaccination world, we felt a little bit more comfortable with sort of resuming a lot of our, our pre pandemic practices, but of course, with just the emphasis on you need to be vaccinated, et cetera. Okay, well, I have a couple more questions. Um, the, you know, kind of, been hearing some thoughts throughout the years that there might be a relationship with the with diet or the microbiome and MS. And is there any more recent research on that? Yeah. So the diet question, I definitely get a lot because there are a, there are quite a few different kind of MS diets that people have probably heard of, like the Schwenk diet and the Terry Walls diet, or kind of like the most common. And the idea is you know, to be on basically like an anti-inflammatory diet. Um, and at least to that part, I'll say, you know, we don't have really much in the way of randomized controlled studies for diet. So there's no specific diet that I tell people they need to be on. Generally speaking, a generally like heart healthy diet is also going to be good for your brain. There's definitely an association that like obesity and cardiovascular risk factors are also associated with worse outcomes from an MS standpoint. So if people ask if there's a specific diet that I recommend, I would say the closest is like a Mediterranean diet and there's no specific restrictions that I put on anyone. You know, everything is better in moderation. I certainly have anecdotally people that tell me that things like gluten and dairy sort of make them feel worse. And so they've, they've cut it out, but that's not necessarily the case for everyone. So I, I sort of tell people, you know, to listen to your body, keep a food diary, see things that are irritating to you, take them out if they're irritating, et cetera. But there's no specific diet um, that's sort of proven to be a good MS diet, but there's certainly more research going on into that here. And then the microbiome, you know, all of that, that, that topic is definitely um, of interest. It's certainly been looked at in other types of neuroinflammatory conditions as well, and other types of just inflammatory conditions too, and allergies and all of that. So uh, it's very interesting. I think we're definitely at the point where we think that, you know, the gut microbiome plays a role in the immune system. And we even have a phase one trial that's looking at um, actually fecal microbiota transplant um, for treatment of MS. It's very, so it's like phase one, meaning like it's pilot. It's very, very early. We don't have the results for that yet, but that's certainly something that we're looking at. And then individuals here like, you know, Dr. Sergio Baranzini and Dr. Emmanuel Wobant are, are trying to understand better, you know, the types of gut microbiome profiles that we tend to see and which ones tend to be more pro-inflammatory. 
Um, there is not much research on that's been published yet, but there is a lot of interesting research that's ongoing at UCSF, you know, for anyone who's involved in some of our longitudinal cohort studies, they actually um, can donate stool uh, to go in kind of our repository and we're looking at all of that data as well. So it's definitely fascinating. It will be interesting to see what comes of it, but a little bit hard from like a clinician standpoint to make recommendations just yet. Great. And then kind of on the same track as the diet question, what about vitamin D? Does mm -hmm. I think does supplementation with vitamin D help? Yeah. So vitamin, low vitamin D definitely seems to be associated with the development of MS, seems to be a risk factor for the development of MS and seems to play a role in being protective for the immune system. So a couple of ways is certainly, um, it certainly is good to keep your vitamin D level up. Uh, one way that I sort of advise people is, you know, people often ask me, you know, about their kids, what should they do since there's probably a small, you know, some amount of increased genetic risk for their kids of having MS as well. And so I always tell, you know, parents for their kids to keep their kids vitamin D level up. Uh, once someone has been formally diagnosed with MS, you know, it's a little bit more variable how, uh, how much additional protection vitamin D has. It's actually a little, it's quite debated right now. Um, the data is mixed. We used to tell people like, yes, you need to, everyone needs to be on high dose vitamin D and we would like replete it to super therapeutic levels. And we've really pulled back on that because it also looks like high vitamin D levels also has other bad side effects as well. So I think everyone's kind of pulled back to more like a, like a moderate to high level of vitamin D, basically avoid vitamin D deficiency. It, I think there probably are still some protective immunologic effects. And the other thing is that it's also good for bone health our patients, you know, are at fall risk as well. So we want to uh, prevent osteoporosis as much as we can. So I, I definitely recommend still supplementing with vitamin D. Great. And we had some great questions mm -hmm. about um, therapies for MS. Um, one of them I am smiling about because it talks about the study, which I believe came from UCSF um, about the over-the-counter antihistamine clomastine mm -hmm. Mm -hmm and uh, for remyelination. And that was kind of found with a really unique, in a unique way, but it's no longer available in the US. Is there any been any more studies on this? Yeah, so we, so there has been a published study looking at clemistine for acute optic neuritis and seems to be beneficial for remyelination. And we actually have an ongoing study that's going on here at UCSF. So we are still enrolling people that are within three weeks of optic neuritis into the clemestine remyelination study. Um, I have seen this be a problem as well because some of my patients just kind of use clemestine off label. Just again, we don't have all the evidence yet to know like whether everyone should be on clemestine or how long they should be on clemestine. But some of my patients just try it, especially if they've had an optic neuritis that hasn't recovered well. I have been able to get it through like different compounding pharmacies, et cetera. So I think it is out there somewhere. I can't, I don't know the specifics, but I do know some of my patients have gotten a hand on it. I got their hands on it. But one thing I have heard is that the price of it has sort of skyrocketed because they know that it's being looked at for remyelination. So um, it, it's really awful that that has happened, but there is an ongoing, you know, clinical trial, depending on the results of that, you know, maybe will lead to formal approval for, um, for treatment in MS, but, but we'll see in the next few years. Great. And then we have a couple of questions about how the immunotherapies are working for MS patients. And there mm -hmm. seems to be a difference in how um, European physicians might practice as opposed to the US. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think this kind of goes to the fact that we, we need sort of better studies overall. There actually are studies right now. One of them is called the TREAT MS study that's actually trying to like stratify people into like the high efficacy versus like lower efficacy therapies early. And, you know, I think some of the complexities of this sort of get into like use of like a national healthcare system versus more privatized and sort of like cost effectiveness. Cause I, I, I think a lot of times in, in European countries, because, and again, I, I'm not an expert in this because I I don't fully know how they practice in Europe as well, but I think generally speaking, they require people to kind of like escalate new therapy first um, because we, we don't have the data yet to definitively say like everyone needs to be on high efficacy therapy early, 
So I, I think when you're generally getting into more of like a national healthcare system where you're looking at equity and cost effectiveness, you know, that sort of makes sense. Um, but, you know, like I said, we're still waiting for kind of more data, more published da data to help definitively say like, we need to put people on higher efficacy therapy earlier, but we don't have that quite yet. So, um, you know, sometimes we run into those issues in the US too, where someone's insurance will refuse to cover a higher efficacy therapy early. And we, we may be forced to start with something you know, a second option first. But again, I I will not claim to be an expert on on how things are done in, in Europe. Um, okay, so to be determined how well immunotherapy, the newer ones are working compared to trying like a stepwise approach versus coming at it from the higher up efficacy medications first. Yeah. Okay, that's all some more straightforward questions. Does MS affect women more or men more? Yeah. So we tend to see it more in women that that is something that we see. And so there's probably some component of, you know, the hormone hormonal relationship with um, with MS as well. There's or different things. One thing that we do see with men is that they tend to have um, higher likelihood of having progressive disease, tend to have higher likelihood of higher disability. Um, but the disease itself tends to be seen more in women. And then what's the age of distribution of when MS first presents in patients? Mm -hmm. we, you know, we definitely see pediatric, um, we see pediatric onset of multiple sclerosis as well, um, but sort of most commonly 20s to 30s. But, you know, honestly, I've seen kind of all sorts of ranges and it may also depend on sometimes people had, if you look back, they probably did have symptoms like earlier in their life, but sort of didn't clinically manifest until later. So I've even made new diagnoses in people that are 60 and 70 sometimes. Um, but yeah, I've, I've seen a very, very wide range all the way from pediatric um, all the way to, to older. Okay. And one last question, the movie Lorenzo's Oil, which I love that movie, uh, talks about complex or fatty acids, I think linale linoleic acid helping with improving myelin. Is uh, that being looked at for MS at all? As far as I'm aware, it's not. And Maggie, you would probably know about this better than me, but that movie was about adrenal leukodystrophy, correct? Yes, okay. it was. So it's a different condition. It was um, this child, um, Susan Sarandon's um, character, um, her child had a genetic condition. Uh, where the white matter was being, um, you know, gradually d dissipating. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I'm not sure that they you even use that for adrenal leukodystrophy anymore. Okay. But yeah, unfortunately, as far as I know, I don't think that that's being actively studied for MS remyelination. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, these are great questions and I um, really appreciate some of you sharing why you joined this course.